All right, good. I'm seeing that number uh, start going up as everybody is trickling into the room. Welcome, everybody, to your September. Is September? Yeah, September. You know, like I'm trying to figure things out as we roll along. Um, welcome to your September hosted at home happy hour. Um, tonight will be a spotlight on our Dolce head winemaker, Greg Allen. Um, for those of you that have not done this before, I say this every time, and yet some people still need the reminder. Before we get started, if your wine is not open, open it. If it's open and not poured, pour it. And if it's open and poured and you haven't started drinking it yet, time to get a little bit in the glass, time to start drinking a little bit. Um, we're going to start with the 2017 Nicola Nickel Vaca Vista, and then we will transition into the Dolce at the end. Um, everybody kind of gets settled in. We will start here in probably about like 30, 45 seconds. By the way, um, I'm going to just start going over some of the ground rules because I see that the uh, numbers are starting to stabilize. Um, we want this to be interactive. I mean, we might even have visuals going on on this bad boy. So just know we want you to be a part of this together. So um, if everybody's ready, I think maybe we can get this rocking and rolling and I'll go over how we're going to run this thing. All right, so for those of you that might be your first time hosted at Home Happy Hour, we have got a lot of options. This is designed to be interactive. We want you all to interact with each other. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you're going to see where it says chat. I don't want to blow any minds, but this is where you're going to chat and interact with each other. Um, we want you to talk about where are you dialing in from tonight? Talk about the wines, maybe what you're pairing with the wines. This is where you all kind of get to know each other, and that's half the fun of this part. Now, if you have specific questions you would like answered, the best place to put that is down where it says Q&A, because then I will definitely see those and I will do my best to get those answered as we're going. However, a little bit more fun, if you can hold your water till the end, at the end of this presentation, we're going to promote everybody to panelists, so you will all have the opportunity to ask your question yourselves. So just know the chat is for chatting. The Q&A is for those pressing questions that you just can't wait. And then at the end, you will also have an opportunity to ask Greg any questions you might have. As I always say, God forbid you have any questions for me as well. I will be here to help. Um, we are going to start with the 2017 Vaca Vista. So I hope that everybody has that in the glass already because we are about to get rolling. I'm going to invite in Greg Allen, the head winemaker for Dolce. And before we get started, Greg, I don't know if you got any wine in a glass, but I'm going to raise a glass and say cheers to everybody joining us here. I sure do. Cheers. Cheers. All right. Virtual background. Right. <laughs> Making my glass disappear. Cheers, everybody. Thank you for joining tonight, this afternoon. <laughs> Greg, uh, thank you for joining tonight. Although I will say if there was any member of the entire winemaking team that was free to join us tonight, you're pretty much the only one that is not absolutely losing your mind yet. So uh, thank you very much for taking the time. This is going to be a lot of fun. I always find the Dolce one the most informative because there's so much that goes into it, no matter what, every time you do this, like I learned something new. So um, before we get into you, super exciting. And before we get into Dolce, which I think for you is more exciting than talking about yourself, um, I'm still gonna pick your brain as a winemaker, as a gentleman who has more general wine knowledge than myself. So let's talk a little bit about this 2017 Nickel and Nickel Vaca Vista that we've got in front of us here. Um, so, just a little bit about this wine. Um, this is one of our newer vineyards. I think the, the 2017, I believe, is the first vintage of this one. Um, yeah, just that's really my quickly, understanding. I wanted, to, yeah. I wanted to ask you, this is an Oak Knoll. From what I know, that is pretty far south to be growing Cabernet. Um, just, I don't know, have you talked to Joe, like what makes this vineyard so special that we can do Cabernet from an Oak Knoll vineyard? Or am I just completely wrong? What just happened before? Well, thank you, Todd, for the nice introduction. And again, it's really nice for me to be here. Um, you know, I'm a fish out of water talking about dry red wines because my yeah. <laughs> specialty is Dolce, but I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah. Um, so just to get the geography situated, if you can imagine the town of Napa, um, the Oak Knoll District is just north of Napa before you get to Yonkers. Phil. And um, it's, it's, it's right at the cusp of where the morning fog that comes off the San Pablo Bay encroaches up into the valley. The valley itself is about one marathon, right? Uh, from the town of Napa to the town of Calistoga. Oakville is about in the middle. And uh, the southern end of the valley is the coolest because of that morning fog and the winds that come off, uh, come off the bay. Um, the 
Oak Knoll District, this back of Vista Vineyard is on the valley floor of Oak Knoll off to the eastern side. Um, it's a well-drained gravelly soil. It's a beautiful location. Um, it is the coolest site in nickel and nickel's portfolio, right? And so this means long, slow ripening, a lot of hang time, um, but really subtle tannins, which makes it a fantastic wine to have with food that's not red meat, right? Like a pork chop, yeah. sometimes a salmon works really well. Um, the flavors... And aromas for me uh, walk between red and and blue fruits. You know, sometimes okay. plum, sometimes a little bit of raspberry, but nice spice and really subtle tannins is what I, sure. I think. Of I mean, it's very like I, the word I would throw out would be approachable. Like, I mean, I mm -hmm. I just opened this maybe twenty five minutes ago, and it's already like just. I mean. I don't want to say too soft on the palate because it does have some weight to it, but it's by no means aggressive, I guess I would say. Like, it's just, I mean, I'm enjoying sipping it with zero food in front of me, you know? like yeah, Right. It's, you know, it's about three and a half, four years in the bottle now, right? So it was bottled in about 2019, yeah, I think. Ish, right. And, yeah. Ish, yeah. right. And, uh, and so it's had some time to resolve in the bottle. I think it's showing really well um, at, at, at this point. For sure. Um, so just a general question, and this is, I mean, it's fun because I get to ask you because you don't have like a horse in this race. Um, but if somebody came to you and was like, oh, cool, you work for Farniente Family of Wineries. Um, what do you think the biggest difference is? You know, going Bella Union, Nickel and Nickel, Farniente, each one of them are distinctly different and have distinctly different, I guess, missions. How would you like if somebody came to you and just wanted like the inside scoop? How would you describe, I guess, the differentiation between the three? Because I mean, we could talk about how different they are for the whole hour, but just like, yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. I mean, so like from uh, forty thousand feet, how are they different? Right. Um, <laughs> well, it's it's nickel and nickel's mission to make single vineyard, single varietal wines, right? So this is a one hundred percent Cabernet Sauvignon. All of it that's in that bottle came from this vineyard. Uh, in, in in Oak Knoll, you know, and what's remarkable about this vineyard, let me just go back to the vineyard part. It's like having had a chance to walk through it, it's one of the most uniform vineyards in our entire portfolio. From end to end of the vine row, the flavors and the development of the berries over the growing season is really consistent. It's like a winemaker's dream. That's what I was um, going to say. That has to make right? the winemaker's job significantly less difficult. Yeah. Like, and, yeah. the, and the grower, like the grower and the yeah. winemaker, everybody's happy with this vineyard, right? So it's a it's 100% Cabernet, you know, and if you speak in terms of analogies, you know, I think of the Farniente and, uh, and the Bella Union blends, at, they're blends, right? Some, not just Cabernet, but, you know, um, Petit Verdot, Cabernet Franc, et cetera. They're more of a symphony, whereas the nickel and nickel wines are more of a soloist, right? And yeah, like, I, I, uh, it's just, you, you don't have a house style for nickel and nickel. You have what happened in that vineyard that year. And that's what makes it so magical. I think sometimes like, like I'll throw out is like Farniente is all about like that house style and expressing the consistency where like, hey, obviously the weather and the growing season is different from year to year but we want you to recognize this as Farniente, whereas Nickel and Nickel is the flip side of the coin. Like, yep, this is what happened that year. Yep. Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm glad <laughs> yeah, to find out I haven't been lying to people. That is a <laughs> positive for me. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> let me ask you the, the ubiquitous question, and I'm not going to phrase it in the way that's impossible to answer, which is how long should you lay this down? I'm going to phrase it. If you have Cabernet at home, how long do you find that you are generally laying it down and why maybe like, cause you know, like, cause how long you're going to lay it down is completely subjective dependent upon your particular palate. So for you, Greg Allen, when you, when you go down Cabernet road, do you have any general like, okay, I tend to lay things down for this long. Well, for, for Cabernets with bigger tannins, I, I think of more time to let that sort of resolve okay. and make it more approachable on the palate. With a wine like this that has more subtle tannin, I think it's fine, you know, at this point. You know, I, I, I did ask Joe because I'm confused. You know, we don't have a history of Vaca Vista wines to, to say what the optimum time is. We only have, you know, four or five vintages under our belt here. Um, but he was thinking maybe 15 years. Okay. Like you could go be, as long as 15, depending on you go as personal long palette. As it goes as long as 15, right? Okay. But I think it's showing really well now. And so I think and in the, the five-year range, 
start enjoying it. Well, and now that we're getting more vintages coming down the pipe, I mean, that's where it's like, hey, do a little vertical tasting of Vaca Vista because to each their own. And now that we'll have more time to be able to kind of see how it develops, maybe we'll be able to narrow it down a little bit. But I just always, you know, those that know more about wine than me, I always want to know if you have in your head a set rule or if you literally from bottle to bottle are like, I'm going to drink it when it tastes good. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. which well, you I know, think is an effective strategy, but like. <laughs> right. But the only way to really do that is to have a lot of bottles of it. Right. And right. then you open one every year till you find that it's really, you know, converging on that sweet spot. But sure. not all of us have have that luxury. So if yeah. there's a rule of thumb, I would wait for a few years after bottling to, to yeah. get into a Cabernet. Um, if you know that the tannins are more gentle and supple, then then err on the earlier side. If it's a hillside, you know, um, something like that with uh, stronger tannins, you know, then maybe eight years or more, somewhere around there. And then, I mean, and that's the great thing about wine is you age it. And then you drink it. And if you're like, that's not quite right, you get another bottle, you try it again. And eventually you find that sweet spot and you get to drink a bunch of really good wine while you're figuring it out. So mm -hmm. I can think of worse problems to try and solve. You know what I mean? Like as somebody that comes from a fairly scientific background, I mean, that's the kind of science work I want to do. If this is the constant and the variable is what vintage, let's do that experiment. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, ha I have to say that, you know, this is my 24th year working for Farniente, right, uh, making Dolce. And I have demonstrated over this time period that I'm not very patient. I just can't age the Cabernet lo longer, right, because I like right. to get into it. And I'm just curious. I want to know how it's doing. And then I run out. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, same thing. Like, I, I feel like every year I get my allocation and I'm like, this is way too much wine. And then every year I'm just waiting for Christmas again because I have run out of wine because <laughs> it's just staring me in the face. Why would I not drink it? You know? Yep. Um, yep. All right. So, Greg, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about you because I'm going to say credit where credit's due. And I definitely want to say this while you were on the screen. But like, I don't know who Dos Equis was talking to, but you might actually be the most interesting man in the world. Like I, every time I talk to you, I learn something new and I'm like, come on, man. Like it, it just, it, seriously, I just, you fascinate me, my friend. So like, let, let's talk a little bit about you. Um, tell us a little bit about your background. Cause it wasn't like yeah. you grew up, went to high school and then immediately got into winemaking. You, you had a, a, a circuitous path to where you are right now. Um, your floor. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, so, you know, I, I grew up, I was, you know, born and raised in Newport beach and then right. moved to San Diego at actually East County, San Diego. I grew up in El Cajon. I, I noticed somebody here is from San Diego. So shout out to El Cajon. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I went to high school there and then, uh, and then I went to San Diego state university for my undergrad. And my, my previous professional career was in engineering. And first, uh, working in shipyards. So I worked at uh, NASCO, or what was called NASCO then, it was a big shipyard uh, in San Diego. And then I um, got a job working for the Navy as a civilian engineer at Mare Island Naval Shipyard up here in the Bay Area. And that's what brought me to Napa and, um, and was part of my process in uh, finding my way to winemaking was, was, was moving to Napa. Right. And then, uh, um, I mean, it's just such a train wreck because I've had such a long history in, in engineering right here. Right. I, uh, right, right, right. And for those that don't know, um, you went to an engineering school that a lot of people might not have heard of. You know, you know, yeah. So, know. so just my, so just the, on, on, on the, just the engineering story, right. Is, right. is when the Navy decided to shut down the shipyard, I felt like I was gaining a, a lot of experience in the def in the defense area, and I wanted to to move out and study biomedical engineering. And I applied to graduate school at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and was accepted and studied orthopedic biomechanics in a PhD program there, and um, um, and and find, ultimately earned a, a master's degree in mechanical engineering, studying cartilage biomechanics. And but it was there that uh, I took a break, uh, old, you know, like a 30 year break, uh, it turns out in my PhD program and came to Farniente uh, to do an internship. And this really opened my eyes to working in the, the wine industry. I did uh, go back to engineering and worked as a staff scientist at MIT for two years and then 
and then moved to Switzerland and lived in Bern, Switzerland for about a year and a half doing the same thing in an orthopedic biomechanics lab studying cartilage. And it was there that I was faced with the decision of finishing a PhD or pursuing this crazy dream of, of making wine. And, uh, and here I am, right? Now, was there like an aha light switch moment, an aha light switch wine experience that like uh, you just had the epiphany slash revelation that you were going to go down the crazy offshoot? Not no, the it, you know, you can imagine that uh, like at the high school that I went at in El Cajon, uh, winemaking wasn't uh, an elective. Right. <laughs> and yeah, it's, yeah. San Diego <laughs> State that, have didn't have a winemaking. Junior year wine tasting for them, you know, yeah, that would be yeah. fun. <laughs> And San Diego State didn't have any of that, right? Like, like, I mean, to be seriously, like winemaking and wine history and wine involvement in meals wasn't part of my family upbringing. And so I really didn't know. I, I just had the, the great fortune of having a wonderful roommate when I was at San Diego State that, that paid his way through school by working at a fine dining restaurant in downtown San Diego. And he oh, really okay. opened, opened my eyes to the world of wine. Right. That's, and, I mean, uh, that's how I ended up in the industry working fine dining and you, you start to taste and appreciate is that kind of. He had, finally... these, he had these amazing customers that would order extraordinary wines and they wouldn't finish them. Like they would send him home with half the bottle, yeah. which he graciously share with me. Right. And so yeah. I had this really neat in introduction. Um, when I then moved to work at Mare Island and lived in Napa, I took tours of wineries and, you know, the, the, the first hint that this could possibly work was that I, I, I noticed how much science is applied in the winery setting and how much engineering is there too. And so I didn't imagine myself as a winemaker at that time, but maybe, you know, uh, somebody working on the equipment or, uh, or the technology or the research side. Right. right. Um, but it was when I was at MIT, I had a I had a, a colleague there that absolutely talked my head off about wine, you know, okay. by design. He either complained about the weather or he talked about wine. So you're like, and let's he, talk wine, buddy. Like, let's talk about wine. Like, I don't need negative I'm conversations in about it. So many guests, chilly and rainy. Look, you know? I didn't even <laughs> I, I didn't even own a winter jacket. You know, coming from San Diego, moving to Massachusetts was a real shock. Yeah, um, but. Uh, but at the end, then again, he would share his wine experiences. He compelled me to reach out to UC Davis to ask about the viticulture and enology graduate program in wine science. And, and I did that. And uh, Professor Roger Bolton, who's an amazing and iconic professor in that department, um, told me immediately to dispel any fantasies of romanticism associated with making wine. And he encouraged me to just go like, uh, work an internship. Every winery everywhere needs extra hands during the time of harvest. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I set my mind on coming out to Napa and trying to, to get an internship. Um, you know, one of the other things that I've done since I was a kid was I've, I've been a competitive swimmer or a, a swimmer just for fitness and um, if you weren't going to go there, I was going to prompt you. So that... <laughs> yeah, well, so I, I just, um, so I had I, I I I swam with a great group of people in in Napa, and one day I surprised them. I came out from Massachusetts to visit UC Davis and meet with the faculty there. But I I, I stopped in Napa and I jumped in the pool, <laughs> surprised everybody, did a cannonball, right? Oh. And uh, um, was visiting with one of the guys and said, "Look, I'm really serious about making a switch from engineering." And I'd love to, you know, I'm out here trying to find an internship. And he said, funny that. And he reached over the lane line and tapped the woman that's swimming by in the next lane on the shoulder and introduced me to her. And she was Ashley Heisey, the, the enologist and then future winemaker of Farniente and Dolce. Like my whole connection to Farniente came from a cannonball in the swimming pool, right? But, and it's I just, mean, that's... It's how you make an impact, my friend. It's how you make an impact. <laughs> so it's just like, um, it was, it's just really amazing. So she, uh, she, she arranged for me to come in and do an interview. And this was in 1994 uh, or, okay. you know, the summer of 94. I wasn't, I, 95, sorry. And I wasn't ready to abandon my graduate program in 95. But in 96, I reached out again and she said there was a spot. And, 
and I came out here and hauled hoses and cleaned tanks for eight bucks an hour. <laughs> My parents were were shocked. So right, that, like, uh, yeah, that I would do something when they were like telling that. the story of how proud they were of their son. That that wasn't the part they led with, right? <laughs> But it was such a, it was an extraordinary experience, like to be part of the harvest, to see the, all the, you know, from working on the Chardonnay bottling line. I, I came in time to work on the bottling line for Chardonnay, but I got to see all of the Chardonnay harvest, all of the Cabernet harvest. And they let me stay a little bit late to even see the beginning of the Dolce harvest in 1996, which happened right around Thanksgiving. Um, and it was a mess, right? It rained and you know, yeah. it was my first experience seeing the grapes from late harvest wines, and it was just such an, 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 an inspiring experience that um, I prolonged my my hiatus from graduate school and and secured an internship with a winery in South Australia. And so I moved to a little town just north of Adelaide in South Australia and worked for a mom and pop winery there and, and absolutely loved it, you know, but uh, when that was done... I was faced with being in abject poverty <laughs> um, and I had unfinished business at MIT. And so I went back and, uh, and and had an opportunity to work as a staff scientist there for about two years um, before I went to Switzerland and then moved on. You know, I know it has nothing to do with wine, but what, it, what does a staff scientist at MIT do as somebody that will never have that opportunity? Like, is it just, is it more research based? Are you doing teaching? Like I'm always curious. Well, so I so my job in that laboratory, so the laboratory that I worked at studied uh, cartilage and what causes disease. Namely, we were interested in what caused uh, osteoarthritis. Okay. But in order to understand what causes osteoarthritis, which is the degradation of cartilage, um, we we wanted to to learn what makes cartilage healthy, what defines it, right? And so my job as a mechanical engineer in this lab, in collaboration with medical students and biologists was to make a machine that would squeeze cartilage so we could study the effects of continuous passive motion or injurious compression on cartilage health right so you, and like so, you were, so was it like a machine that like would not only like i guess do like a day-to-day -day movement where it would give you the, yeah. the repetitiveness and how that affected cartilage but also like impactful injury and or sudden Exactly. Right. Okay. And then we had we had the tools to see how the cells would respond. And we had the tools to look at what happened to the architecture of cartilage under such conditions. And this was the link that got me to Switzerland was that in Switzerland, this laboratory had developed the fine electron microscope work that um, could take a take a picture of a cartilage like cell and the matrix around it. Right. And it burn? Uh, huh. Is it burn? <laughs> yeah, and burn and burn. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, this is the first... I know things. I'm proud of myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, so what did I do as a staff scientist? I I, uh, I I worked on fulfilling the obligations of a grant proposal to do the research, to publish the results and make presentations, whatnot on on, on cartilage biomechanics. That, right. I mean, it's just that's just so interesting to me. Like, yeah. I, I enjoy hearing about things that I would never be able to piece together myself. So that's really kind of cool. Like I, and I think that speaks to like to transition back into Dolce. I think it speaks to like, you have a very analytical, I guess, kind of approach to things as I've seen. And I think especially with the wine you are making, that is probably the wine that our company produces that needs that kind of analytical, analytical and critical thinking. So that kind of leads me to chicken or the egg. Did you always yeah. want to make Dolce or did Dolce find you and then you learn to love it because of the process of making it and how special it is? Yeah, I, uh, the short answer is I think Dolce found me. Okay. You know, I loved all the analytical stuff that I was doing and I had visions of, um, you know, bringing my analytical and chemistry background to to a winery environment and using that to study you know berry development or what happens over the course of the fermentation or what's happening over the course of barrel aging you know with in terms of wine quality um but, but i'd always imagined that i'd be a, a, like i i loved making or being part of the wine making of aromatic white wines in okay. australia and that's really where i thought i was going to end up and and as I was winding things down at the University of Bern and deciding to go back like full on into the wine industry 
I, I had an offer to go back to South Australia and, and work there full time. And when Ashley Heisey at Farniente heard that, she just said, whoa, <laughs> we'd like for you to reconsider. We would like for you to come to Farniente and work on a special project. And, and, uh, and that was enough for me, right? To come back to California, to establish residency here, and to then move on towards enrolling in and finishing the, the viticulture and enology program at UC Davis. So I, I came back to Farniente. I started on January 6th, 2000, and have been here ever since. And the special project turned out to be Dolce. You know, for uh, from uh, from the time Farniente was was founded and restored by Gil Nickel in, in 1982, I think was the first vintage there. And, and Dolce was made in 1985, I think on an experimental basis. Uh, the Farniente winemaker had always made Dolce, Farniente Chardonnay, and Farniente Cabernet. And by the time we got around to the late 90s and Dolce was growing, becoming more established, it was it was really clear that somebody needed to focus exclusively on Dolce and its peculiarities um, because it's a whole separate harvest that requires a tremendous amount of strength and endurance to get through at right. the end of an already very exhausting harvest experience. And it was just, it was just too much, right. For, for one person to do. That would have, I, that. I can only, like overwhelming amount of work. Plus, I mean, I can only see having to transition your brain from like quote unquote normal still wines to then transition over to Dolce, which is a completely different animal. I feel like from start to finish. Yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, I think um, one of the, uh, really interesting things about late harvest wine winemaking is that it's it's not a given that it's going to happen. I think, um, you know, for a winemaker making a dry wine, there are certainly massive challenges in, in making, you know, Farniente Chardonnay. It's not an easy thing to do. Right. But I would say that you're, it's almost with certainty that you're going to harvest something. Right. Now, you're right? going to get something. You're going to get it. You're right. going to get something for Dolce. That's not the case. It just is. Um, it's it like first you need to have ripe fruit, which this year hasn't even happened yet. Right. And then on yeah, top of yeah. that, you need to get the the infection of the noble rot, which we'll talk about. And then and then you need to have the conditions to allow for the concentration. And then you need to get 100 people out there to harvest it berry by berry. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and not only 100 people out there to harvest it, but 100 people out there to harvest it correctly. Because yeah. I think I've heard stories of like incorrect harvesting of Dolce and how that is, we'll say, negatively impacted the vintage. Like it, it just seems like, like you said, start to finish, completely different. Like I, yeah, um, we've learned so, a lot of things along the way. You know, like my uh, my predecessor Dirk Hampson, who was the longtime winemaker and, and then director of winemaking for Farniente, and who's just recently retired. Um, he founded Dolce. You know, he started it, and uh, he, it was through his experience of working in Germany and working in, 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 uh, in Bordeaux, like near the Sautern region of France and, uh, and saw the production of these amazing wines and thought that we could do that here in the Southern part of the, of the County where it's cool. Do you know, I don't, Dirk was like, wasn't he the first American to work on some of those like high-end classic Sauternes I think I saw somewhere? Dirk was the first American intern at at Chateau Lafitte Rothschild. Okay, that's what. Yeah. Okay. Like that. I mean, yeah. Like I mean, we we I, I we have a legacy of pretty much amazing winemaking at this place. And every time I hear something new, I'm like, that sounds about right. Um. <laughs> so we're gonna transition over, talk a little bit about the Dolce, get a little bit more in depth. Um. We're gonna do some visuals, and I know April's gonna help us out there. But mm -hmm. you just talked about these conditions that you need to even be able to make Dolce, right? Yeah. What factors from day to day do you think most impact your final flavor? Because I know, I mean, I know we, we're going to talk a little bit more about how you get to that final flavor. But like from year to year, what mitigating factors do you think most impact the final product, I guess? Aside from obviously wow. you need the product. Like, I think that, that there's a lot of, I mean, this, this, this is a, 
I would give a similar answer if I was talking about Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon, sure. and that the, the biggest influences on flavor are the climate. Um, you know, that's what's really driving the ripeness. But what's different for Dolce is the action of Botrytis. You know, okay. and so both of both of these things, like the um, the climate and the action of Botrytis, are things that I really don't have a lot of control over. Right? I mean, we can make way we can make changes to the way that we grow the grapes. We can control the fruit load to try and optimize ripeness. Um, we can limit the hydration to try and convince the vine to stop growing and to make flavors. Oh, look. Yeah, okay. So, okay. Here's okay. A so, that, so, yeah. So, that's what, because we're getting into the nitty gritty, and there might be some people on here, especially with it being hosted at home. Yeah. That have no idea the process for Dolce, just because I mean, it is completely, yeah. completely different. So, like, Take us through the process. Well, those, like, I mean, okay, so regular still wine, right? <laughs> Bud break, grapes grow, you harvest them, you press them. Yay, wine. You know what I mean? But you, you've got a few other things going on. <laughs> it's harder than that. I mean, I guess. No, so, yeah, but they're not on this call. So I'm giving let, credit to let, you. <laughs> let's go ahead and if we could back up a slide. Let's let's say, so let, let me just take you to the Coombsville area of Napa. Okay. So Right here, you can see the Johns Creek Vineyard, which is off Third Avenue, east of the town of Napa. You can see in the background the hills. These are the these are the hills of the of the Vaca Mountain Range, uh, but on the Napa side, and and it's a uh, it's an amazing location for for growing Chardonnay, and it turns out for growing uh, Semillon for 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 Dolce. It's just it's it's a very cool location. We, it's covered in fog. So this is a this is a late September morning when I took this photograph. You can see that there's this fog that's sort of yeah. up in the hills, but also low lying. Right there's just humidity everywhere. By the time that we took this picture, there's no more Chardonnay on the vine. So Nicole has harvested all the Chardonnay for Farniente. Okay. Right the 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 leaves here are starting to go into senescence. They're turning yellow. They're they're soon to drop off. But when we when we planted these 17 acres to Semillon for Dolce, we applied the conventional wisdom of grape growing in reverse, right? So most people who are planting grapes are planting grapes to uh, reduce the likelihood of having mold grow okay. on them, right? And right. the way that you the way that you do that is to, is to allow airflow through the fruiting zone, to allow sunlight, filtered sunlight at least, onto the fruit. And, and you do that by separating the leaves from the fruit, right? But for Dolce, we wanted to promote conditions of humidity so that we could get the germination of the noble rot, this Botrytis, and, uh, and, and, and have it go, right? And so what you see here is a huge canopy. And if you look really carefully on to the on the left side, you'll see the fruit there, right through that little window between the leaves. Yep. Um, that, you know that's where the fruit's hiding under the leaves. Okay, and then so the next picture is is what we want to have happen for Dolce. So the 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 picture on the left is a ripe cluster of Semillon. This is when you would harvest it to make a nice dry wine. Okay, like you know, like a white Bordeaux. This is what it would look like. Um, on the right is a cluster that's been infected with Botrytis. And that's okay. the beautiful, beautiful cluster that I'm looking for for harvesting Dolce. Notice there's a couple berries that are still green. Like the way that Botrytis works, it seems so random, but it's a mold that, that gets into the fruit. Some berries are completely affected. Others are completely unaffected. And and then uh, ultimately you have this shriveling and dehydration, which concentrates the, the sugars and the flavors. And that's what I'm looking for before we go harvest. So if you go to the next picture, um, this is a this is a cluster that's almost ready to harvest. Uh, you've got Botrytis everywhere. Some berries, you, you, you can tell it's Botrytis because the berries turn pink and then mauve, right? right? And then this, then the spores start growing on the outside of the berry. When the spores grow through the skin, then it perforates the berry skin and it allows for warm, dry weather, if you are lucky enough to have it, to induce the dehydration, the removal of the water through the berry to concentrate those sugars and flavors. It's a process that's different from raisining. Right. And, That's and, this, is, and, and, and this is really important, you know? And so 
one of the things that's been really important to me over the course of my career is to continue to have like part of my brain engaged with research. Oh. And and I've been delighted that the ownership of Farniente has has allowed and supported students from UC Davis to to do research projects in conjunction, you know, with me and a faculty advisor at UC Davis. And one of the most amazing papers that we published was in 2015, where we were studying the, the, the plant pathogen interaction of botrytis and the grapevine. And what that means is that when the botrytis infects the berry, the grapevine itself senses the infection and it changes its gene expression. It upregulates the production of a lot of tannin some of which is flavor active and aroma active. And so the, the presence of botrytis not only leads to the dehydration of the berry, it also leads to the creation of flavors that wouldn't normally be there. Now, in effect, right? like if I'm trying to overly simplify it, is that almost like the plant's immune system kicking in, trying to yeah. like mitigate I, that's, this? That, that's how I would classify it. Like the, okay. the, plant, the plant's been infected, it's freaking out if I can anthropomorphize the plant, right? It's it's right. freaking out that there's mold on it, right? It's saying, get it off of me. It's <laughs> making more and more tannin, you know, and some of that tannin leads to the honeysuckle character or some of, you know, the other interesting and subtle aromas that come from these kinds of wines. Okay. One of the things that I've, that I've always been perplexed by was why does the berry turn pink when the botrytis infects it? And we've discovered in this paper that that the the green the, you know the the green berry semione has on its genome the gene to make anthocyanin which is the red pigment of red wines it's just not expressed right and so as part of its reaction to the infection of botrytis it partially upregulates the production of anthocyanin making the skin turn pink as so like an indicator, it, yeah. It, it turns I mean, a recessive characteristic slightly more dominant, or is that, that like that's it? That's it. Okay. That's it. Exactly. That's it. Right. Okay. So, so, anyways, Botrytis is this magic thing, and that the 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 take home message here is that not only does it allow for the dehydration, you know, in a process that's different from raisining, but it also introduces novel, um, you know, new and interesting uh, flavor and aroma compounds. Okay. Gotcha. So, so then how do we go from here to the winery? Right. So I, 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 Slowly last, and carefully. <laughs> last, last year, last year I made some videos. And so here are some videos of the harvest process. Um, so you go ahead and play it. This will just, I mean, they're really like less than a minute each video here, but when we're harvesting Chardonnay, these people would be running through the vineyard harvesting about 400 pounds per person per hour. And for Dolce, there's this thoughtful selection. He's looking for things that I don't want. And then he finds that there's vinegar in there and, and yellow jacket damage, insect damage. He smells it, gross. He drops it to the ground, right? And then he goes to the next cluster. If I'm lucky, we're harvesting at a rate of about 15 pounds per person per hour with each harvester being specifically trained to look for the signs of botrytis, but not just that, but also to look for the signs of the things that I don't want, like insect damage, molds other than botrytis, raisins, um, you know, and, and underdeveloped berries that just don't have good flavors. So they're making all these decisions. And they're using SNPs to like, you know, drop these berries off one at a time. This is just an overhead drone shot showing, uh, about one third of the workforce that was out in the Dolce Vineyard last year. And they're not moving, right? <laughs> and the bins are empty and we've been out there for like an hour. <laughs> I mean, I guess right. that means they're doing it right. So uh, just a question about like, as they're yeah. harvesting, right? Um, Cause yes. I know when you're talking about old wine, like we talk about bottle to bottle variation. Is there cluster to cluster variation like when he found that one that had the yellow jacket damage would he be safe to assume that the entirety of that vine probably is no good or is it literally still just cluster to cluster within the same vine you might have some that you want and some that you don't like there are sometimes the 
there are usually berries that you can salvage from okay. every cluster, right? Okay. Sometimes the damage infuriatingly happens right in the middle of the cluster. It's not like you can easily get it out. And so sometimes okay. you have to let go of the whole cluster. But there is a tremendous non-uniformity even amongst the cluster, right? Think of it from the vine's perspective, right? Here I am anthropomorph anthropomorphizing the vine again, but, but the grapevine wants to produce berries that contain seeds, you know, for propagation. Right. And it and and the and the berries themselves are these packages that enclose the seeds. And and if they ripen at different times, then you have a wider window for birds to come to eat the berry, to fly away and drop the seed and propagate the plant. The right. vine wants to have as wide of a ripening window as possible. And the challenge for the viticulturist and the winemaker is to manipulate the vine through irrigation or pruning practices um, oh. to, to convince the vine to ripen everything within a relatively small window. So like you're almost like the winemaker is almost doing their best to fight nature. You know what I mean? Like uh, it, we're pushing like back. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. We're pushing. Yeah. We're pushing back. Mother nature always wins. You know, and it's, about, but it's a humble. Whatever we can do to take, you know, like Mother Nature is going to win the war. <laughs> we just want to win a couple battles, kind of a deal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm just making a okay. suggestion. Yeah, perfect. All right, so we're hand harvesting. So, how long does harvest, like bol dolce harvest, generally last? Since you're moving at obviously a much more measured pace. Yeah, I'd say, you know, for, for now I have 21 acres under, um, you know, uh, Dolce's program. And I would say between six and 10 days okay, uh, to get through harvest. So here, this is a video that's sort of highly polished. It shows the process from the vineyard, but all the way into the winery, right? And so um, the bins are filled and then the fruit will ultimately make its way to the winery. There's no opportunity for sorting the fruit at the winery because it falls apart, right? So it that's goes straight into the press. The juice comes out of the press. It's this dark brown liquid, right? Did you see that? Yeah, like, like I was this. like that. That is not the liquid gold that we are. Uh, it's not thinking it's, of when we think Dolce. You know, like, you know yeah. the the Dolce's juice is just like the juice for Chardonnay. Um, it turns brown, right? Okay, and that's and it's the same process that happens like when you take a bite of an apple or you cut open an avocado. You, it's the it's the phenolic compounds that are reacting with oxygen and they turn brown okay right you can you can counteract that you know like on your avocado a trick is just to squeeze a little lemon on it lemon. and the citric yep. acid prevents the browning um you know uh but for the juice here so I mean, I, let me just talk about this slide this oh. yeah we bouncing around here so that that yeah so this 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 bin of heavily botrytized fruit right would probably take 50 people of uh, about an hour, hour and a half to, to fill up. Right? Well, it comes okay. to the winery. You can go to the next slide. And it's not sorted. It's just dumped straight into the press. Here, the guy in the forklift with the extension there dumps it into the hopper, into the press. The press has this, you know, it's a big cylinder with a gigantic bag in it. It inflates, it pushes out the juice and uh, the juice falls into a tank. I, and at this point, it's really important to stabilize the juice. I recognize that Dolce is this microbial zoo um, because of its exposure. It can easily spoil. And in some years, we've lost you know, a lot of juice because of a vinegar infection that runs away. So we, right. we, we, we put it into the tank as quickly as possible. Like the tank that you see on the right is jacketed so that we can refrigerate the juice and bring it down to about 45 degrees Fahrenheit and let it sit there for about two days. And all the solids, all the, the think of grape pulp, all that pulp will settle down to the bottom of the tank and we'll take off the clear juice. And then that clear juice then goes on to the winemaking pathway. It, 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 it's inoculated, it moves to barrel for fermentation. I think the next slide shows uh, the next step in the process. Yeah, so I take take it from the big tank. One of the things that I do that drives the cellar master absolutely nuts, and it's kind of like my investment strategy of diversification. I'll take, you know, we could fill that one tank with all the juice from one day of harvest. 
And if the conditions are right and we're harvesting again the next day, I might put the next day's juice into that tank. And then I have one big tank of juice. And then I take that juice that's hopefully sugar correct, about 34, 35 degrees bricks. Okay. And, I, and, I, and I divide it into smaller tanks. Two, three, maybe four. I keep dividing it until the cellar master rolls his eyes and tells me that that's enough. Thanks. And, and then I add a different yeast to each tank. And what okay. comes out at the end are completely different wines that when they put back together in the blend bring like tremendous complexity to Dolce. And so here's an example. So after the wine's inoculated in that tank, we fill barrels. And this is what's happening in the last picture here. We fill those barrels. And then there is where the wine ferments for up to six months and then spends a total of 28 to 30 months in barrel uh, before I take it out and blend it and bottle it. Now, that's not the complete end of the process. From day you are in the vineyard harvesting to day you pop a bottle of that vintage and are proud to serve it, what is your average, like what are you looking at as like a general time frame from vineyard to table, I guess? More than five Ish. years. Yeah, right. that's what I'm saying. Yeah, like I, I think a lot of people would be incredulous to know that. I mean, like I know, for example, in the tasting room, the current vintage that they're pouring is 2016. You know, like that's right. That's what we've got today, right? I right. think the 2016 Dolce went out today, right. and uh, this was an ex that was an extraordinary vintage. We started harvest on October 27th or something like that, and we had six days of harvest, finishing around November 7th. And that's on the early side. Like if, if I can start in October harvesting Dolce, I am ecstatic, right? Yeah. Mostly we're harvesting in late November, you know, around last Thanksgiving. Last year it was Thanksgiving. Like Thanksgiving ish. Yeah, absolutely. The, the vineyard crew was delighted because we harvested Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And the and the winery crew was really sad because yeah. we came to work on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in the winery to move that juice down its pathway, you know, from the tank to get to be inoculated and then, and then into barrel. The um, latest we've ever harvested Dolce is December 7th. Okay. And it, that's so, and like then, now, and, it, let me ask and, you this. Now, if, if it gets to like, at what point, I hate to say this because I don't want to bring bad juju out into the world, but at what point in the year do you start to get concerned that like, maybe the botrytis ain't coming or I'm not going to get everything I need. Let me just say, I'm a nervous wreck from the beginning of September <laughs> okay, like today, to, today included, right. Um, uh, all the way in, until we're done because at, at, at any time um, too much rain could end the season. Right. right. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm just losing my train of thought thinking about all the things that can go wrong. You know, My bad. in that, in the, no, no, it's okay. It's just like, we, we, we try and, and, and deal with these things. I recognize that, that in, in some years we've lost almost the entire crop to, to yellow jacket or wasp damage. Like these app, these uh, insects have a voracious appetite. There's no food source for them. Um, after October, when everyone else has finished harvesting and all the yellow jackets of Napa Valley come to my vineyard, um, and you so throw that to, party, man. You know, <laughs> well, we just have a lot of traps set up around the outside, and and this right. is what leads to such the. This is what is the main reason for the slow, meticulous uh, harvest rate is that we really need to look at every single berry and make sure it doesn't have insect damage. Because if it does, then there's the source of the acetic acid uh, fermentation that can that can ruin the whole vintage. So, well, um, go ahead, sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, no, that's okay. Um, so I know like people have the 2016, we've, we've got a yeah. couple of questions that we definitely want to run through because there are definitely some common, but necessary to answer yeah. questions, but yeah. this particular vintage, can you maybe for those that might've already poured it, kind of talk them through the flavor components and characteristics that you're getting from this 2016? Um, Yeah. I've got a glass right here. My Perfect. Because then we'll, you know, like at yeah. the end, we'll talk about the uh, the questions that you get every single day and we'll let you run through the answers. But like Dolce is one of those that like, while I always say, I guess there are certain characteristics that I find carry through the vintages I've tasted. There is yeah. still a discernible uniquity from vintage to vintage. 
Yeah, you never really know what the fruit nature is going to be. Right. Um, you know, when when in in general, the first year that Dolce juice is in barrel as it's becoming wine, it has a pale straw color and it tastes like a peanut colada. Like it has this really strong pine, pineapple character to it. And th these are just the short lived fermentation smells. And after aging in barrel, which allows for subtle oxygenation, these weak like the, the pineapple aroma is is a weak chemical compound and it's broken down or absorbed and is no longer present. What, okay. and, then, and then what happens is that the real fruit nature of the vintage emerges, whether it's stone fruit like apricot or peaches versus citrus. Some years it could be orange and other years it could be lemon, you know, flavored. Like the 2007 reminded me of a lemon bar because <laughs> it was just so strong lemon but um and then uh, and then rarely it can be more tropical like lychee um uh, flavors but mostly it's it's citrus with orange and that's what i get with the 2016 i have okay. to say that this like like sometimes when i talk about conceptually what we do in the in dolce land i i speak of the theoretical textbook harvest Right? right which I, which which never really occurs it's just like the goal right what i would love right. to see like, but the, hopes and dreams but, right? but the 2016 was was just that like the level of, of the botrytis infection was high and the quality of the infection was tremendous and the cleanliness of the fruit like the absence of yellow jackets that year made for a really enjoyable harvest experience and then like on all that's interesting. What's what's really important is that the the flavor of the wine was extraordinary. Its aroma is strong and lifted. Like it, Dolce. Yeah. Like this Dolce reminds you of itself all the way through. What you smell is what you taste is what's in the is, is what's in the finish. A thousand right? percent. It, and yeah. and you know and this year I made I think twelve different batches of, of Dolce. You know, and each one of those batches is fine, but it's not Dolce. Like some, some of these batches can be a little alcoholic depending okay. on where the fermentation ends and other batches can be sweet and syrupy depending if it's a, like a low alcohol um, fermentation. It's the blend. And so as I'm tinkering with the blend and putting different combinations of all the batches together, the one that makes my mouth water the most and like makes it feel like it's filling my mouth is, uh, is the one that I choose to put in yeah. the bottle. Honestly, it's the one that is makes it the most difficult to speak clearly after you taste it because your mouth is watering so much. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, that would be a really a uh, fun selection process to go through. So you know, I wouldn't be mad yeah. at that at all. Yeah. Um, so so for this one, I I do get orange. I get some apricot and some pear. There's a lot of spice that comes through in Dolce for me that I absolutely love. Like this is what I, I'm I'm really looking for. Something that reminds you of of. Uh, of like baking spices, pumpkin spices, okay. th things like that. Just nuances to the fruit, right? All right. Well, um, we're going to try to get into these fun Dolce questions. And I mean, if there's anybody to ask. Um, one of the first things, so let's say, you know, those at home that are joining us open their Dolce tonight, right? They didn't finish mm -hmm. it. You know, they got a little bit left. They want to savor it. Like as long as they cork that and keep it properly refrigerated, how long do they have in your best estimation? Well, I would say three weeks. Okay. If you put a, cor put a cork in it and stand it straight up in your refrigerator so it doesn't leak and make a mess, right? Okay. right. My, my tasting group can't tell the difference between a bottle of Dolce that's freshly opened versus one that's three weeks old, usually. Okay. You know, okay. there's always one or two people. But, but years ago, I did a test with a, about... 30 people in the room and we, 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 we did this, we experiment where we, we tasted newly opened bottles versus ones that had been open for two weeks and three weeks. And it wasn't until after three weeks that people could really tell a difference. And some people loved it still when it was that old. I think it's just because of the higher than expected level of phenolic compounds and the sweetness, this wine is incredibly robust in the face of, 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 um, of oxygen i know i see that question in the chat right and that's what i saw Dolce. too yes I was, yeah. and you know what that was actually the one that i was gonna so 
I'll tell you what, why don't we, we'll start promoting everybody to panelists so that they can ask questions. But the next question I was going to ask was the, mm -hmm. as Dolce ages, it's changing in color, right? Yeah. Can you give us the reasoning behind that? Like, is there a particular scientific reasoning behind that? I it's mean, the, it's the, the, the oxidation that, that happens naturally in the bottle. So you know, me, so that, I, I get like, like when I, sherry, how it is yeah. like almost like an oxidized Mm -hmm. wine and so it's that darker color same yeah. almost basic is that okay so like when you talked about how the chardonnay juice can go darker if it is like in oxygen yeah. for a little is it kind of that same concept same same thing but i think the dolce is forgiving of it you know like if you have a chardonnay that's from two, 2010 it's going to be dark right yes and it, yeah and it's it's fruit aromas may be gone there may be more nuttiness like what you would find in a sherry and in fact, the 1989 and 1990 Dolce, our oldest Dolces that we have, right? They're a dark amber and they have a nuttiness to their aroma. They're very low fruit aroma wise, but, but on the palate, you can still get apricot and peach and orange and they're palatable. I mean, they're delicious actually, yeah. right? Yeah, like I well, just the, the re I uh, uh I've been at the wine club member lounge, you know, slinging the juice on Fridays and Sundays, and we're actually pouring the 08 Dolce, and people are just shocked by the color difference. But I feel like they're even more shocked by like how complex the 08 is, because yeah. I think one thing I found in is like everybody that loves Dolce, like you get that Dolce and you're so excited, it might last a month in the cellar, much less multiple years. And if you got the patience and you got a couple of bottles, I, I highly recommend letting one sit down because it really does develop these different notes that I don't get when I drink it right when it comes out. Yeah. You know, by the time the Dolce is released, it's already got, you know, three years of barrel age, maybe two or three years of bottle age. Um, you know, the wine club will get the 19 vintage th this okay. fall. And, uh, you know, that was another extraordinary year, but I would say you can set that one down for quite some time and it'll be just fine. The 16 is showing really well today. <laughs> right. And, um, and it, it, you know, how old is that? I can't even remember when I bottled that <laughs> six, so, six, six uh, years ago. The question that how did the color change from brown to gold? I, I would think more gold to brown. Is that like... I? Kelly, you know I love you, and I know you're sitting there in Dublin. But are we talking about the uh, the the Kelly? If you can hear me, unmute and kind of uh, ask the question yourself because I want to make sure. Because that's what see, because that's I, I'm looking down. And it says like you know the juice. It goes from brown to go, but it goes more from gold to brown. Yes, or am I completely missing? Yeah, that's the mark? that's right. So when the when 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 the Prior to fermentation. Sorry, that, that question is from our eight-year-old. Oh, there we go. Dude, Al, what's going on, man? Yeah, the, uh, well, I can still answer it, right? I mean, yeah, it, the, the, the juice is brown, but over the course of the fermentation, there is this, uh, you know, the, the redox chemistry changes, right? And okay, it, now it, it, move, it goes I'm from that brown juice, right? By the time we rack it off the solids and move it to the tank for inoculation, it's already cleared up. It's like the absence of oxygen. You know, I do add about, well, I do add a, we had bentonite, which is a clay used for clarifying the juice. And it grabs these molecules that have turned brown and pulls them to the bottom of the okay. tank. Right. And so when we rack the juice off the clay, the bentonite, it's clean and it's at that, that pale straw color. OK. Right. That and, was more. And, that was OK. Now I get that. And by the way, I saw the wave from the eight year old asking a question. Thank you, Flemings. Love you guys. Like they've been on all these. They're they're good people and they're from where I'm from in Ohio. So win win for them. But hey, you know what? If an eight year old has questions, that gives him 13 years to learn a little bit more about Dolce and then he can really enjoy it. You know what I mean? Like. <laughs> Um, so well, anybody else? Do we have any questions out there for Greg? Like I want to, uh, Dolce is one that tends to inspire. All right, Deckers, I see hands up. So you get to go now. All right, here we go. Yeah, so kind of a two-part question. First off, Greg, uh, thanks for being here. And uh, you've been really helpful. In, uh, us being some of the, the novice wine people, uh, your explanation tonight was fantastic. So, Oh, thank you. 
My question is, is that as the equipment has changed through the years, uh, for instance, talking about the wine press, as a farmer would talk about is John Deere, the manufacturer of that wine press and how it determines the outcome of that wine through the years. Have you seen the presses get better? That's helped in the, the quality at the, at the end, getting that, that perfect wine. And obviously, including the, the actual vine versus uh, the grape might have been before, but now the combination of the vine, the grape, and then the equipment. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, the, the equipment's really important, right? And I think that the biggest changes for us have been making improvements to our refrigeration technology in the winery, right? So having, having, being able to control the temperature is, is really, really important. And so having the tanks with the right jackets that can help transfer the heat out of the wine to stabilize it prior to fermentation or to arrest fermentation um, when I need it by moving in, you know, air handling equipment uh, to, to drive the barrel room down to about 40 degrees Fahrenheit to encourage the yeast to stop their fermentation. That's the real needle mover for me. Like if we could talk about the presses for a minute, I, um, I make Dolce at Farniente and all the equipment there, most of it is, is scaled and designed for Farniente Chardonnay and Cabernet production, right? So it's really optimized for those programs. In the areas where I saw the greatest opportunity to improve Dolce's quality, it was it was to convince the ownership that we need smaller tanks. So, you know, because Dolce, you know, I make two thousand cases of Dolce, and the you know that takes up maybe one or two of the tanks that the Farniente uses for the Chardonnay program. So being able to make the 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 as many small batches as I could possibly do requires the right size of tanks. And so the, the the big needle mover for me was after the press, not necessarily just the press. Thank you. Yeah. But, you know, there is one press that I would love to get. And, uh, and you've reminded me of that. Thank you. And it's the champagne press, the kind of presses that they use in the champagne region of France um, are really optimized uh, for extracting juice, but but not really um, overdoing it with tannin extraction, and and they do an amazing job. It's so funny because that the that the, it's so funny to me that the that the champagne presses would be the ones that I would imagine would be best suited for the late harvest wine because they're at completely opposite ends of the harvest. But the but there's one manufacturer called Cocard. Uh, that, that makes a press that's really appealing to me. It's just a matter of convincing the Farniente winemaker that she should get it so I could try it. Worst case scenario, Greg, we'll <laughs> slap together a GoFundMe. You know what I mean? We're gonna... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm oh, thrilled. Um, like we, we have made so many advancements um, in the winery with the infrastructure around refrigeration and tanks that that, that really satisfies um, me there. I think the next project for me really is to focus on the vineyard, uh, number one. And then number two, um, training up people to follow in my footsteps, you know? And that's like what I, like, yeah, I was going to say, what what are we going to do when you decide that you're like, you know what, I'm going to go do other stuff? Okay. Well, fortunately, fortunately, the entire Farniente seller team knows everything that I do. And every, 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 every two weeks, I taste every batch of Dolce with the Farniente winemaker and the Farniente assistant winemaker. And the whole team knows what I'm doing, right? So it's just a matter, like over the next 10 years, I'd love to train somebody up to really shadow me and then take over the take over the process. And then I'll hang on as a, as a consultant, right? But just to make sure, like every like there's continuity with Dolce. It's so important to me. We're yeah, not gonna let you just flee. Like, yeah, you're, we're gonna we're yeah. gonna have you ease the transition. We'll say worst case scenario. We're, you know, we prefer you yeah, just well, hang out it. forever and ever and ever, man. You know, right? <laughs> but but I think you know having youthful energy involved, right? And having somebody that has the hands on, you know, like 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 the the desire for hands on winemaking together with the science background, I think is really important. So taking resumes. But yeah. but not yet. I mean, I'm not ready to give up yet. I just keep, you know, keep your eye out. You know, when he starts yeah. asking for resumes, everybody start putting everything together. You know, like well, <laughs> we'll hold open yeah. interviews in the Chardonnay cellar. Right? <laughs> the 
There's only a million things to know, and it takes a little bit of time to to get all that and across. And from year to year, it completely so. changes anyway. So that's you know. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Uh, does anybody else have any questions at all? This has been a super informative one, but I want to make sure everybody gets their questions answered. All right. I mean, Greg, you just did way too good of a job. So, I mean, nobody has any questions left over. Um, I will say thank you all very much for taking some time out of your evening. We really do love doing these hosted at homes, but if we didn't have all of you joining us, it would just be me talking to Greg and that wouldn't be nearly as fun for him. Um, for everybody that is on this, I will say next week, you are going to get a recording of today's tasting. Um, you will also receive the information on the wines that are going to be in our next shipment next month will be a lot of fun as well. Um, if anybody needs to re up, because I mean, obviously both of these wines are so delicious that one bottle will not be enough. Get onto our website and use the code hosted at checkout. That's H O S T E D. And you will receive 20% off of your purchase. So that way you can. Do this whole tasting over with another group and surprise and delight your friends. Once again, huge thank you to Greg Allen, our head winemaker for Dolce. I appreciate you taking some time from being a ball of stress to come and talk us through this. Once again, I always yeah. learn something. Well, it's my my pleasure, Todd. Thank you. And I just appreciate the opportunity to share you know, my experience uh, with everybody here. And I don't I don't want to leave everybody with the impression that it's doom and gloom and, and really hard. You know, um, there are, I mean, truly the, the thing that I enjoy most is knowing that Dolce is shared at special occasions. And, uh, and I just can't leave also without saying that my favorite pairing for Dolce is savory, not sweet. You told me about you know, this like, one. Yeah. And, 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 and I, I had the opportunity to convince a chef to, to try this um, just recently again. And it's a recall ravioli with truffle in a lemon sauce and this uh, this combination of, of soft savory s salty creamy is absolutely perfect with with dolce and uh, i just uh, would encourage people to to move beyond the creme brulee even though that's a classic and delicious pairing or a fruit galette but to try something like the ravioli even tuna tartare sure. works really well, but I love the ravioli. And so with that, um, yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what, listen. actually, that's what I love. Write in, you guys try some pairings with this, write in, tell us what you think really works. Cause I mean, I think that would be really cool to hear some of the savory pairings that people ended up with that really hit home. Um, yeah, yeah we look forward to hearing from you. I look forward to seeing all of you next month for hosted at home again. Greg, thank you, my friend. Yeah. Um, everybody else, please enjoy your evening. I'm Todd Elliott, I am your hosted at home host. And I look forward to seeing everybody soon. Uh, I expect to see you all at the winery this winter. I will be waiting for you there. Please enjoy the rest of your evening and savor this Dolce. Thank you all very much. Appreciate you being here. Have a wonderful night. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.